Dylan, thank you very much. Well, good morning and welcome. Okay, welcome to the First Unitarian Church and to the fourth in our series of eight uh, Summer Forum Speaker Series. Uh, the order of service indicates that Kathy Chambliss is giving the welcome. Uh, um, someone in church last week asked if she was my daughter, and uh, uh, I'm Tim Chambliss, uh, member of the board and member of this church for about 38 and a half years. Um, we're honored today to have Roland Cook, Cook come and speak to us, and uh, he has a very impressive background, uh, a bachelor's in criminal justice, a master's in business administration, 29 years working in with Salt Lake County uh, Corrections, starting as an officer, right up to chief deputy. And then uh, five years ago in uh, 2013, April, uh, Governor Herbert asked him to take over responsibility for the uh, State Department of Corrections. Did that for half a decade and has just retired and is a more of a free man now to speak about important issues dealing with law enforcement, criminal justice, and bringing a more humane approach to incarceration, especially at the, uh, at the prison level, but it spills over to jails as well. For perspective, here in Utah, we have over 6,500 people right now incarcerated in our two state prisons, about 4,500 down Point of the Mountain, about 1,500 at uh, Gunnison, and there's a spillover into a number of the uh, uh, county jails. We have 29 county jails uh, throughout. And uh, as you may know, there is a state prison relocation that's going to take place in this city uh, at taxpayer expense, which was not voted on by uh, the taxpayers, but it's going to happen. And uh, we expect the population in Utah to grow maybe twice by 2055, 2060. And does that mean, uh, will the prison population double as well? The, uh, these are fundamental questions that we can talk about as well as maybe the standards and policies uh, that are used for uh, Utah's state prison system. So uh, with that in mind, let's welcome our guest today, Roland Cook, to speak to us, and we'll have question and answers after the offering. Roland. Good morning. After watching all of you walk in, I'm just so tempted to take this jacket off. Would you mind if I did? Okay. <laughs> Okay. So, after all those years of wearing suit and tie, it's, uh, it's been 60 days without it. It's been awesome. <laughs> so, um, there is so many things to, to talk about today. And uh, one of the things I want to do is I want to make sure that we have plenty of time for questions and answers because I'm sure you guys have plenty of questions for me. Um, as I told Tim, and he's uh, heard me speak before, I am very transparent and... Um, I'm, I'm very plain spoken and I'll let you know exactly what's going on. Uh, I think it's important, it's important for all, the, all of our citizens and all of our people to know exactly what's going on. And when I kind of hear Jim said he can speak freely, um, I spoke pretty freely before, um, before I retired too as well, because there's a, a lot of important topics that we deal with every single day. But let me just tell you a little bit about myself, how and what my thinking is before you start asking questions. So I usually talk about, uh, one of the first things you need to know is I sort of grew up in a church just down the street from you here. Um, I went to First Baptist Church from the time I was four until I was about 25. So when they said I was speaking here, I knew exactly where I was coming from. But what I usually like to say is that I'm a Baptist, born and raised in Utah, married to a Catholic. So my kids are really screwed up. But I begin by saying that because I want you to know that religion really played a role in who I am and what I do. And also the LDS religion played a role in that. The reason I say that is um, you don't mess with me um, unless you're messing with the ladies in the neighborhood that I grew up in. Um, when I retired, everyone's always looking for something, oh, he did something wrong or there's some big coup that's going on or something's happening. No, I was really just tired and wanted to be with my family. But the first people that called me were those, those ladies from the ward, other than my mom, who was completely stressed out, and still is today. Anytime someone writes anything in the paper, um, she's wanting their address and, and phone number and asking if I can look them up for them. But those ladies, just to give you some perspective, I was raised by a village. I want you to understand that. Um, you know, I used to play 
ward ball. Some of you guys know what that is. Um, basketball, one day I was there, one night I was there playing basketball, and a gentleman walked into the gym, talked to the coach. The coach walked over to me and said, Rollin, I'm sorry, you can't play anymore, you need to go home. At the time, I didn't really know what was going on. But why I wasn't allowed to play was because the person that came in said I wasn't a member of their church. I lived about two blocks away from that, from that church. By the time I got home, my mom's standing on the porch saying, what did you do this time? I said, what are you talking about? I said, I just got told I couldn't play basketball anymore. She goes, well, you need to go back over there. Mrs. Walker must have got a hold of the bishop, and you will be playing on that basketball team. And I went back to that church and played basketball with my friends. We grew up in First Baptist Church. We did everything together. We bowled. We had a bowling league I was on. We went camping together. I noticed you guys are having a, a camp out coming up. I got to tell you, as a kid, I love those. Those are the greatest things ever, just to get up into the, into the forest and the woods and not have to worry about anything. There's just something special about that. But anyway, the other thing I want you to know, for example, the people that had effect on my life were coaches. Um, it may be hard for you to to believe because you look at me and you're, you're trying to figure out, okay, who is this guy? And you hear that he, he grew up as a corrections officer and uh, the first image is he's got a crooked nose so he probably got busted in the nose one time or, one time or two. The reality is um, I cried a lot when I was a kid. And um, my friends to this day still tease me for that. If I got up to bat in baseball and I struck out, I started to cry. For whatever reason, I couldn't help it. And there was a basketball coach that I had who was at one of my games. And I got up to bat, and I got two strikes on me, and I got to tell you guys I was crying at that point. And all I can remember is just like water in my eyes, the ball hitting that mitt and saying you're out. And I was making my walk back to the bench, and the coach, the baseball coach at the time, said, why are you crying again, you big baby? Go sit on the bench. You're not going to play anymore. So I went to the bench, and my dad was there. So I, people are going, does he have parents? Yes, I have parents. I could talk to you about them uh, for uh, many, many minutes. But I went to the bench, and from the bleachers came my basketball coach, and he came down there. He walked right in. I don't know that he cared what the baseball coach thought. Put his arm around me and said, Rollin, it ain't going to matter. 20 years from now, 30 years from now, you're going to be something special. You're going to be doing something great. Don't worry about baseball. Don't worry about striking out. Another story to tell you is about Obert Tanner. Any of you know Obert Tanner or remember him? I worked at OC Tanner, and I worked there as a maintenance person. I used to go in at, during high school, and I'd clean up around there. And one, of the, one day, uh, in fact, one of the things I did was clean his office, and he had a bathroom in his office. And the important thing that was, I mean, or thing that impressed upon me is whenever I walked in there, he asked me first couple times if he saw me, he'd say, what's your name, son? And I'd say, Rollin. And most of the time when people say Rollin, Tim said it right, they'll say Rollin, not over it. Every single day he said, good afternoon, Rollin, how are you? And then one day, just a simple thing, you wouldn't think it's much, but when you're cleaning someone's bathroom, how humiliating that can be at times. He just said, Rollin, there's something I want to tell you. Come over here. So I walked over to his, to his desk. And I don't know if any of you guys remember over, he was like just a very, he was a very tall, thin man, but he seemed like he was about seven feet tall to me. Very kind man. He said, Rollin, I want you to know something. I've never had anyone clean this office better than you. I want you to know what it means to me to walk in every single day and know that you've done the very best you possibly could, and you do a great job. Now, why am I telling you about this? Mostly because I want you to know who I am and what I am and what my principles were as I grew up through corrections and the things that we implemented in the jails and in the prisons and the things that still need to be done every single day. And I want you to know a little bit about me. Because usually, as soon as you hear I noticed there was a sign on the front door said, no weapons allowed. Do you think I'm wearing a weapon? <laughs> Tim, did you shake me down? The answer is no, I'm not. In my entire career, I didn't. 
I did when I would go out with my family because of threats and different things that I had to do. But I know that there's an another way of dealing with things, and we've known that all along, and I've been taught that throughout this time. But, Tim, you need to shake people down if you're going to call in cops and stuff. <laughs> anyway, so that's just a little bit about me, where I grew up and what I know. Um, I really want to open it up to questions because I'm sure you're going to have plenty. We can talk about some specific topics that Tim brought up. But if you'd like to ask me questions, let's begin that way, and then we can kind of go whatever direction you think you'd like to go. Okay. Well, then in that case, we're going to go to our offering right now. Okay. Oh. So, so we're going to give you a chance to sit down and relax. And Dylan, you have the piano, and we'll pass the plate, and then we'll go to questions and answers. Um, you want to do it that way? or I can, Okay, we'll do it. Dylan, thank you very much. <clears throat> what we're going to do now is we'll go to questions and answers. If you have a question, please raise a hand or nod, and Kathy and I will alternate with the microphones. You need the microphones in order because this is being recorded, both video and audio, okay? So uh, in just a moment, we're going to start with a question here, and then we'll, we'll oh, forgive me. We're going to start. I always defer to central administration. So, uh, so, uh, First question will be here, and then we'll alternate over there. Okay. Hi. Hi. Uh, can you tell me how you got interested in corrections? Oh, great. That's a great question. Probably not what you think. In fact, oftentimes when I, when I talk or I speak at different places, I talk about when you're growing up, you're not pulling your red wagon around thinking, gosh, I just hope I become a correctional officer. <laughs> they make so much money. Everyone loves them so much. Um, so it didn't begin uh, like I, you know, I wasn't, wasn't thinking I was going to be a correctional officer. But one thing I was following, again, going back to First Baptist Church, um, I was involved in scouting. And uh, a couple of the folks that were involved in the leadership at the time, um, one's Cliff Lever. He was a chief of, well, he was assistant chief of Salt Lake City when he retired. And also Mike Cannon, who was in corrections. He worked for adult probation and parole. And I wanted to do something in service. I just kept being drawn to that. I still am today as I'm sitting here 60 days actually retired. I already just can't stand it. I've got to be doing something. I'm driving my wife crazy. So what drives me to corrections is a sense of service. Initially, when you first get there, though, I mean, we're talking I started in 1989, folks, and my nose is crooked for a reason. They didn't hire me because I had a sense of service. They hired me because of my size and athletic ability. And although I cried when I struck out, they didn't know that. I didn't do that in the interview. But what drew me to it is I, as I continued, I could see there was going to be a future. I could see that um, when I would, this sounds, I don't know, simple, but sometimes you actually do feel like you're making a difference in their lives. Um, there was a lot, of, a lot of kids that I grew up with that I would suddenly see behind bars. Um, you know, I tell a story about, for example, a, a kid, his name's E, he's now passed away. 
but his name is Eloy Martinez. And as, if you cry a lot when you're a kid and you're in sports, you get picked on. And I showed up early for one of my games. I rode my bike to the game. Um, and a couple of kids started picking on me. The next thing I know, Eloy's riding up on his bike, and he throws his bike down and pushes those boys away and uh, stood up for me. Well, our paths went different ways, mostly because, in many ways, uh, the opportunities I had were different than what Eloy had. And to see him across the bars and to be talking to him and knowing um, which way his life was going, you could see that there was going to be a, a difference that could be made if you really did something beyond sticking someone in a cell. You could see it. It's changed so much. But it takes a lot. So I, I, I know those questions are going to go there, but what I'm telling you is that we've come so far when I tell you they were hiring me for size and athletic ability, they literally said, uh, Rollin Cook, if you'll eat that tray of food that just came down from the kitchen, from the jail, you're hired. To the point that we were actually looking for people that had leadership skills, that had conflict resolution skills, that were educated, that were willing and wanted to help people. That's a big difference in who you're hiring. And then you're only paying them $18 an hour who wants to go to work in a prison for $18 an hour and have those types of skills? It's tough to find. So asking the question, I would tell you, I didn't grow up thinking I was going to be a correctional officer, and I certainly never thought I would be chief or executive director. If you'd have told me that, I would have said you're crazy. But uh, that sense of service, the things I got from my community and so on, led me down that path. Okay. My question uh, has to do with your thoughts about the monetization of incarceration and the profit motive and its influence on how we treat prisoners and um, how the public employees involved in the correction system interface with the private profit system and oh. how that's going to play out in the future. Okay, so you said a swear word to me. I think I heard the question, if you're talking about privatization of corrections. Is that what you're talking about? Okay. So the private, the first thing that comes into people's minds when you retire as the executive director for the Department of Corrections anywhere is the private corporations are going to contact you. I have not received one call. And the reason is I've been very much in opposition to uh, incarceration for profit, because that's exactly what it is. How, are, how do you motivate, how, how do you justify um, that sort of thing when you're, you're making money off someone being incarcerated? What's your motivation to get them out? You can pretend all you want that you are doing your pro, you're programming, your rehabilitation, and so on. When your bottom line is based on keeping an inmate incarcerated, there's two problems with that. One, just that, just that, did you hear that? You're incarcerating somebody, you're holding someone in custody for profit. That alone should really raise questions. And then the thing that you need to know, I'm probably, boy, there may be someone in here from the private organizations, is they're trying to make money. So what are they going to cut? They're going to cut programming, they're going to cut food, they're going to cut all of those things. Whatever is a high cost, whether it's medical or whatever, and just look at the, the challenges we have from a public sector trying to provide medical treatment and so on. So you said the swear word to me, which fires me up pretty good. The thing I would tell you is that you must always fight it. It's not going to go away. It's not. You're always going to have private corporations, um, CCA, others, who are going to try and make money that way. And they call on the very best. So maybe I'm not the very best. They call on the very best as soon as they get done, sometimes before they're done to bring them into their organization and figure out ways that they can manipulate it and keep people in their systems. Oh, no, go ahead. I think most people don't know that there is such a thing as uh, private prof for profit influence in the correction system. Uh, well, if people don't know about that, I don't understand how they can oppose it. Well. I, I guess I would say, and I don't mean this in a rude way, you, you, um, you have to educate yourself in it. Even I have to. It's just like everything else. How do you fight it? 
uh, well, you got to go do a little bit of research on it. Um, I'd be glad to speak to anyone. I can give you my phone number and we can talk in details. I can share uh, articles um, that give you some information about certain things that have gone on, even as close as Idaho, where they had reduced staffing so much that the inmates were basically running the facilities. But I, I, I wish I knew that answer. I'm sorry, I wish I had a better answer for you other than you educate yourself, you watch for it. Uh, watch for it when they, you need to know that was one of the options for the new facility. Well, we may not like every single answer that turned out, but when I, when I met with the governor the, during the interview, can you believe that? I interviewed with the governor, I was in his office. That's really weird, sorry, I have ADD really bad. Sometimes I just get really, can you imagine sitting, I was sitting in the governor's office, sorry, I gotta say this. I'm sitting in the governor's office and he was running late the first time I ever interviewed for that job and I'm sitting there thinking, am I getting punked here? One of the questions he asked me though was about privatization and what my feelings on it. And I let him know. So the one thing I would tell you is that we fought the privatization. Those people were in the audience when I was speaking to the legislature. They were in the audience when we were making presentations. So they're there, we fought it, you're going to have to always fight it. If you don't want it in your, in your, in your city, you've got to fight it. I, I hope I answered your question. By your body language, maybe I didn't, but I tried. Okay. <laughs> yes. It, it seems that there's some great research, um, and um, it, it's interesting that it was done by the United States, and yet we don't use any of it. And there seems to be examples of it being used perhaps in Europe and other places with um, prisons and um, helping um, prisoners to be uh, mainstreamed again. And we have examples in Mexico, Thailand, all over the world where they don't use any of that. And it seems like we use pitifully small amounts of that very research that we've done that we know is successful, whether it's food, how we treat prisoners. I've been out to the prison. It's a travesty. So where is the research and where do you stand and the, why is it not implemented? The, well, first thing I'll say, I agree with you 100%, and, but I would tell you that it is implemented and I would glad, I'd be glad to put you in contact with the people. Well, you're, you're shaking your head. I Again, I'm I'm, all I can really do is tell you the things that we're doing. You're talking about the data-driven research that shows how we can do things differently in regards to incarceration and in, and in regards to reentry. Those were the very things we began implementing as part of the criminal justice reform. It's still in the early stages. The things I tell you, yes, there's things going on in other countries that are fantastic. When you said Mexico, though, you're, you meant the opposite, right? Okay, so what we have to continue to do, and we're, we're doing those types of things, um, not only at the state prison, but across the country, um, we're implementing the things that are trying to improve those, those opportunities. For example, while I was there at the prison, we re-implemented the, the education program, not just high school, not just GED, but the University of Utah now goes up there and enhances that education. We also began a program just in the last year that I was there that helped prepare inmates for reentry. So we actually take them out of the, the general population and we put them into certain parts of the facility and we provide them things such as iPads. Uh, we provide them things such as um, uh, pre preparation, you know, in interviews for preparing for interviews, resumes, helping them find jobs. We're bringing in the private sector to help them employ them prior to them even leaving the facility. Also, you probably know about correctional industries. So for years, correctional industries basically was to keep inmates busy, okay, doing wood and all this other kind of stuff. Again, that change is occurring and has been over the last two years where we're now giving those, those, those people opportunities to get jobs that are gonna lead to jobs out in the community. We're bringing in the private sector for things such as welders, construction, it isn't just go out and make them busy. Now we're bringing in the private sector to help them do that. Also the programming and rehabilitation while I was there, and again, if you hear it's just gonna take a while, you can't stop. You have to continue to push these things. When I was there, um, we began the process, we brought in a, a director from Chicago, actually from, um, from Iowa, he was working in Illinois, 
And he was, uh, he was beginning the process of implementing many of the, the data-driven programming that you're talking about. Is there a ways to go? Absolutely. But we are making some progress. I want to ask you what you think about respect for recidivism and what that means to you, what it means to the state, and what it could mean for the future of incarceration. Because we have got the highest level of incarceration in the world. So a couple of things. When you talk about recidivism, you can't just be talking about re uh, reducing the amount of time that somebody goes back into a correctional facility. What you also need to be talking about, and what usually catches everyone's ear, is that when you reduce recidivism, you, you improve public safety. That's the part that often gets missed, especially when you do things like criminal justice reform that we haven't really talked too much about. One of the first things that they started to resist was that, and you still hear them arguing about it now, is that all you're worrying about is reducing recidivism. You're just putting people back out and you're not providing any treatment or anything like that. You're, you're making it unsafe. It goes back to the question that uh, the person asked just a few minutes ago in, in regards to what are you doing. Again, it takes a long time, but you have, to, you have to have things in the community for these folks to be placed into. So when we talk about, hey, we want to reduce recidivism, again, I feel like I'm almost campaigning for you guys to fight. The thing you have to fight for that we didn't get as part of that criminal justice reform is things in the community. So we do, we invest as much as we possibly can to prepare them and get them ready to go out. And then they go out and what resources are there? You're gonna be talking to Pamela Atkinson here pretty soon. She'll be the first one to tell you there is no resources out there. So a key part to the recidivism piece is making sure that the things that we have in the community are there and available. Also, incorporating all the people that are sitting here. The person that goes out to the prison and actually makes the effort to help those folks is huge to us. Every, th this is a problem for everybody. It's not just a problem that some people can ignore. One of the things I talk about oftentimes is um, people are always talking about, we don't want to have any sort of programming. You need to just lock them up. Let me tell you what happens is typically all, all you need is one person in their family. I get phone calls all the time, or I did. Hey, we're all in. My nephew just got put in prison. Is there anything you can do for him? And it's the same person that told me they just want everyone locked up and they want us to build facilities that just treat them like chickens. So it's important that we do reduce recidivism. And part of that criminal justice reform that is beginning the process, again, we have to keep moving it forward. What happens is it becomes the, the hot topic for a while, and everyone jumps on board. And we were moving down the right train and talk about data-driven uh, results. We didn't just go make up the criminal justice reform. It wasn't something we just made up. We, bought, we brought in the uh, Pew Trust organization. They came in and brought the data from other states and said, okay, here's the things you can try. Here's the thing that's working in Texas. Here's the thing that's working in Washington. Yes, I said Texas. They've reduced their population of incarceration by 15,000 over the last 10 years. And no one talks about it because they're so conservative. But they've done it. Same thing with Washington. We went, and, we went and, and met with Washington to talk about the programming that they're doing inside their facilities and implementing them there. The problem is Utah, per usual, is about 10 years behind. So we had just barely begun that process, but you have to be engaged in it. Um, I guess to talk a little bit, just to sort of round up that question, it was also recidivism was in our discussions in regards to the new facility being built. When we brought in Pew, and their goal was to help us reduce recidivism and to slow the number of people that are going back into the prisons, it wasn't to just make it so that there wouldn't be any more because the population continues to grow in Utah, there, the, the key was is to curve it and to slow it down so you didn't have to build as many beds. So that was part of that discussion that we had in, in that regard. So um, the reduction of, uh, of recidivism is a very complex uh, discussion that needs to be talked about uh, public safety. We need to talk about people being involved. We need to talk about resources out in the community. So we all, I, I get the feeling that you're all with me we want less people incarcerated, great. Then put the money towards something in the community that they can turn to. 
Because when you put them out there, they still need that support that's not there. Thank you very much for coming and speaking to us today. Uh, it is a two-part question. What can be done to keep people uh, from entering the justice system to begin with? That's got to be the most economic and best for everybody involved. And then secondly, from your, based on your experience, what are three things in prison reform that could be done to, that are realistic that could make things better? And one of the things I, I hope you'll address is how do we make it so people that are leaving the system can get employed, that they don't have that stigma that keeps them from being employed? Okay. So I'll try to answer those questions the best I possibly can. So to begin with, the part that's never discussed is the, the uh, prevention of things. No one ever, when we sit in meetings, it's nearly it's seldom discussed about what sort of investment are we going to make, especially in, in the juvenile side of things. Now recently here in the state, we went through juvenile uh, criminal justice reform as well. So that's in the process, so it's improving. What sort of things can we do is invest in that, in, in that portion of our criminal justice system? Preventing people from coming in, whether it's in high school or anywhere else. We're so quick to put money towards, this sounds, because it's important too. It's, it's, we're so quick to put money towards STEM, for example. What money are we putting towards prevention of crime and keep, keeping kids out of trouble? We don't do any of it. We, we, just, we just don't. Um, what was the second question? What can we do to make our prison system work better? Oh, okay. And then on the back end, how do we let those people be able to be employed without the stigma of having a record? Okay, great. So again, that process is beginning, and you have to continue <laughs> to be the, the voices. If that's what's hard when you leave. This is the first time I've spoke since I left. And now I find myself saying, well, when I was there, those things continue, though. But one of the things, for example, that we're doing is we, we change the way that we uh, manage our, our inmate population. Um, isolation cells um, have been reduced. At one point, our state was one of the highest in placing inmates in isolation. The one thing that we know is that that, one thing we know, uh, is that that just makes people worse. You know, one of the first things I noticed when I got there to the prison, for example, I had a, my grandmother was uh, a paranoid schizophrenic. And I didn't really get to know her until my dad went and got her from a California institution back in the early 80s, late 70s. Um, and I saw a, a, a woman in one of the isolation cells within my first couple weeks. And the first person that flashed into my mind was that person, um, was, was my grandmother. And that could possibly be her sitting in a cell on the floor on a mat with just a little hole in the door that someone came through once an hour and looked in and then closed. Uh, the things that we can do is we can continue to, to move away from isolating inmates for long periods of time, and we're doing that. Uh, we met with, uh, oh, it just left my mind. We've been working with, I can't think of it, it'll come to me in just a few minutes, a national. Uh, we, we became one of the states that was going to address uh, isolation and, and, uh, and punitive cells. And um, we also, the, the other thing we can do is exactly what we've been talking about, is investing in ways that we can prepare them for reentry into the community. And the way that you do that is through education, you do that through rehabilitation, you do that through giving them life skills. A lot of times you heard me talk again about myself and the things that I had. Many of the people that we have that go into those uh, that go end up incarcerated didn't have peers, didn't have mentors, don't have people who are, are willing to help them find their way. So one of the programs we also implemented was a peer program that these folks help these folks once they get out, to help them stay connected with the community. The other thing is that we've been bringing people in from the community and providing those services there and, and connecting them, for example, uh, someone with workforce services coming in to help them, someone with housing coming in and helping those folks. And remember I told you that we put them in sort of a, a preparation um, unit to be able to prepare these folks to be able to get out into the community. And then once we, when we get them there, then we have, we, we've changed the way that we even train our probation and parole officers which made some of them crazy. 
I mean, I don't know how many of you remember, but after about two years that I was there, you suddenly had probation and parole officers who were on the news. Of course, it, it rings more to me, maybe you guys didn't hear, that were complaining that I was being too soft, that we needed to be more tough and more, more strict. We had, to put through, we had to put our probation and parole officers through three years of different training and, and being able to communicate effectively, being able to problem solve, being able when you roll up on someone who is high, rather than instantly taking them to jail, that you get them to a hospital or you get them to a rehabilitation center rather than take them back to incarceration. So there's a variety of things that are being implemented now um, in that regard that can improve that process, but you have to continue to invest in it. What was the third question? So again, the, way, the, be, the very best way is to not just simply kick them, kick them out. You have to involve the community in that process. So we have a committee of folks that work together. Something that we began probably about four years ago where we brought in all the people from the different social services to work with us and be able to come into the prison and be able to work out in the community with our offenders. So that's one way. The other thing is you bring employers if you think, for example, uh, if uh, someone's going to go apply for a job and they're covered in tattoos, what's their, what's their ability to get a job? It's not there. But what you can do is we bring now, we bring employers inside the facility to help them understand and get them involved in preparing these folks for jobs, getting to know them. It's amazing how they become the advocate for the person and want to hire them once they get out. I have a very simple question. Um, when you first started talking, I, I don't think I could have said that I knew what a corrections officer was. And um, I'm gathering through the discussion, but I'm curious, can you give a description of what a day looks like for a corrections officer? And um, just two other little points there. How do you see that role evolving? In, in 20 years, what, are, what do we hope that role looks like? And also, to what extent, I gather you're not a prison guard, is your role defined by your authority over the prisoner? Are you more like an authoritarian figure or are you more kind of a teacher? So just looking it's for a, a little question. more description. So to begin with, if, uh, as I mentioned, back in 89, it was almost exactly what you said. Um, I went from uh, everyone was, uh, the customer was always right to the customer was always wrong. When I was at O.C. Tanner, the customer was always right. When I got to the jail, the customer was always wrong and it didn't matter. What a correctional officer goes through every single day, think about it, is a wide variety of jobs and responsibilities. Um, for example, one minute they're dealing with someone who has never committed a violent crime in their life. They're nothing, uh, they're, they're, they're mentally ill. They're suffering from um, delusions. They're um, trying to uh, just get through the day, just function every single day. Then you have a, another moment where you're working with the worst of the worst, I would say. Worst of the worst are the ones that committed violent crimes that have been in gangs their entire life, that are looking for ways to manipulate the officer, to find a way to just make their own lives better while they're in there, to gain their power and so on and so forth. And then the next minute you're dealing with a, a, a female offender who maybe is pregnant that um, is due to deliver and they're scared and they've been in, in jail for the past, I don't know, four months. They got transferred to the prison. They're, where's their baby gonna be delivered? And all the dynamics that's dealing with that. Then you're dealing with a situation where you don't, don't know what's gonna go on behind you when you're walking down the hallway. You're worrying about, for example, what's going on at home because you make 18 bucks an hour and you know you're gonna have to leave as soon as you get off work after working a 12 hour shift, you're gonna go to work four hours somewhere at a part time job. You're figuring out how you're gonna deal with, with daycare. You're feeling out, oh man, I got this grumpy old lieutenant who started back in 1989, who still thinks that it's all about being an authority and we should just be locking them down. And then I got this crazy executive director who has these great ideas, supposedly, that we're gonna let them out more often and that we're gonna educate them and that we're gonna improve programming and so on and so forth. And then you drive home. And I want you to know that they, um, recent studies have shown that correctional officers um, are 35% more likely than any public safety, and you already know public safety's uh, 
uh, suicide rate is high. Correctional officers are 35% more than that. And they're showing that correctional officers have PTSD equivalent to those that have been in the military. So where is it going? It's going in a great direction. That's what I'm kind of telling you. But it takes time. For example, when I got there to the Department of Corrections, they weren't doing background checks on the people they're hiring. It takes time. Remember, everyone was being hired for what? To warehouse these folks. So it takes training. It takes, it takes people that are going to come in. We have more volunteers per capita that come into our prison than any state in the country. And that's what we need. But those correctional officers are going through that transition. Again, when I say, I, this is like, again, my first time I've, I've spoke since I left. The people I left behind are continuing that direction. And it's going to take that. You have, to, you have to find officers that have the ability to communicate, to problem solve, to not walk around. I mean, a lot of times I teach a class about correctional officers and leadership. You, if you think you can be Billy, kick butt, going to mess, you're going to get hurt. We built this new facility is going to be direct supervision, similar to what the Salt Lake County Jail is now, where the officer works inside the unit. You have to be a communicator. It's like community policing, except for in a facility. Treating people with respect. See, I can go on and on. The, the deal is, is that it's changed a ton in the training, and everything's going to have to change. What do I see them in the future? More and more, it's going to be like, has anyone seen it? I know someone has. Has anyone seen, for example, what they do in Austria? Some, some of the jails and prisons there, okay? We won't all have that. What it is, it looks like an apartment. That's what I was trying to get even in some of the, the facilities that we have that are being built now, just something that you'll be able to prepare them for re-entry. Because how do you go from being in a, where they feed you through a, a hole in a door to being able to go shopping, buy your own food? How do you go from that if you go from a prison to the community? So there's facilities now across the, uh, across the world that have that sort of environment that you can step people down to, or step people up to, if that's what you want to call it, that helps prepare them for what it looks like. What are those officers going to look like? More counselors. I've seen, it has not changed. Since 89, <coughs> we went from, you'll do what I say, now to the point that we're trying to communicate and trying to be understanding and trying to help them get the programming and so on that they need. But we still have those folks in the system. The officers that have been there 25 years, count back 25 years and how much corrections has changed. It ain't going to be easy. Hi, we got to get you. Uh, hand. She's been raising her hand. Yes, sir. Um, you, thank you for coming this morning. Thank you. Um, I have a question about, um, you, you alluded to it a couple of times in your last two answers. I was wondering, uh, since the prison system is now the largest uh, uh, provider of mental health in the country, I was wondering what specific things you guys do for that. Um, do you have, uh, are, are the guards trained, uh, trained uh, or do you have professionals? Do you have a lot? Do you have enough to handle the, the problem? Yes to the training for the officers. No, do we have enough help? thing I'll tell you is that uh, one of the things we began in Salt Lake County when I was there is we worked with the Department of Corrections and began what I don't know if many of you have heard of crisis intervention training it's what many of the police officers have out in the community that helps them deal with the mentally ill and it's one of the most impactful classes that that was ever provided I mean they actually one they take you to the state hospital two they put you in a simulator where you hear voices similar to what someone that um, that hears voices uh, experiences, uh, it scares the, the crap out of you. You understand suddenly what it would be like to have to deal with that every single day. We grabbed that training and we made a, a, um, a corrections version of it. So now our, our officers that work in those units get that type of training, but that's not enough. We also, it, you know how difficult it is to hire someone that will want to work inside of a prison in a mental health facility when it's not even designed for that? Um, one of the things I guess I would tell you that you probably already know is when they closed down all of the mental health facilities in the 1980s, they all went to a correctional facility. What we, my only answer to you is, you have to learn to accept the fact that you are going to be a mental health provider. And you have to do everything in your power to improve that service to them. Because that's not going to change until the entire community 
in this world, in our world, in the United States, changes to the point that we understand we can't put people that are mentally ill inside of an institution that is designed for custody. It doesn't work, it makes them worse, which goes back to some of that um, discussion we were having about isolation cells, because that's where they get placed, right? Because they become um, violent. So one of the things we did as we designed this new facility, simple things like windows, it's really freaking everyone out, especially the officers. Are you kidding me? At the, end of the, at the end of the unit, it's windows like this. And remember when you came in? Sorry, I, I'm going crazy standing behind this. Remember when you came in and said, how does it feel to be in here? How great it feels. You just, you feel like there's a, a special feeling when you come in here. Well, you know what it is? It's called light. It's called love. It's called earth. And having that in our new facility, having windows that they can actually see out of, facilities that are designed instead of with steel doors, you're still going to have to have some way to lock them in because it's a custody facility. But having it instead of being steel doors, you've got windows. It's those types of changes and those types of designs and different things um, that will help. Uh, again, trying to find someone who wants to come work for the state as a mental health provider that pays how much is extremely difficult. Time has gone by since the decision was made by the legislature to move the state prison. Um, could you give us a refresher on why and in what ways the, state, the current state prison is deficient in programs and physical capacity? In what ways is it deficient to the point that we need to move it? I need a refresher. That is a great question, and I'm not belittling your question. If, if you've ever gone out to our, our facility out there at Draper, you'd be appalled. She said it herself. When I got out there, it, it, was, it was so bad. For example, even the officers were living in areas that you wouldn't think anyone would want to work in. Um, we, we have shower areas that were completely rust. Everything's falling apart. You have facilities that have been out there since the 1950s. You have some facilities that have been out there since the 1980s. The problem that people don't understand oftentimes is that correctional facilities are used 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, every single day. And they wear down three times faster than any building that typically would be used for, for other reasons. Those facilities are not designed for um, programming, for education. For example, there's a one uh, one of the areas has a, um, a classroom that's an old uh, cleaning closet. They put a table in the middle, put four chairs around it, and that's where the person that's teaching the class does it. Other programming is done right out in the hallway. Instead of it being in a room where there could be some privacy, where the people are talking about the challenges that they experienced, there's no place to do any of that types of programming. So we've talked about where is corrections gone or where is it going, if we are going to make a difference in someone's life, you have to have the facilities to be able to do that. The mental health facilities, the medical facilities, the housing facilities, the transition to a new, to, to back into the community facilities, facilities that are designed for that. None of that is that. It was designed to warehouse people. That Wasatch area, if you go and look at that, that eventually they'll allow everyone to take a tour. I, I tell you all, go. Because what you're gonna do, that'll save you a trip having to go look at Alcatraz, because that's what it is. It's dark, it's dirty, and they do the very best they can to keep it up, up to where it needs to be, but it's about having facilities that provide the changes that we've seen in corrections. We've seen that warehousing doesn't work. So the facility and the need to have facilities that we can move to, move these inmates to, is very important. I read an article, I wish I could remember where I read it recently, about the drug abuse in the Texas prisons and that guards are essentially bought off and the prisoners are running the prisons and that this, this was an ongoing process and, and maybe that was a political statement of what, but, but anyway, if you could just respond to that. Sure, the first thing I can tell you is that yeah, that absolutely happens. Um, drugs are brought in by staff. Things, if you're typically going to have anything happen inside of a facility, whether it's weapons or drugs, it's typically brought in by staff. 
I don't know that I buy the, uh, the statement that the, the inmates are running it, but I can tell you that that is actually one of the arguments that I always ask for in regards to changing from what's called indirect supervision to direct supervision. As I say, um, the inmates own, when you have a linear style facility, which is the one that has, for example, a long hallway and bars and, and them locked up that way and the officers on that side, the inmates own that side. The only time that the officer even has any sort of ownership at all is when they got to go in inside the facility. So when you place an officer inside of a unit, then you own the entire thing. So there's always that thought that the inmates run it. In fact, I saw, I try not to watch correction stuff, but my wife had it on. And uh, <laughs> the, it was on that very topic. And it was talking about um, uh, prisons in Mexico and Costa Rica, where the inmates are actually running it. And so that's my impression of what it is. So yes, I would tell you that's a constant problem. I told you also that when I got to the Department of Corrections, we weren't doing any background checks. So sometimes that leads to problems. I've also told you along the way, um, when you're making $18 an hour, how do you make it? it they run into the same vices that anyone else does. Um, when you're suddenly, you know you gotta make a, a payment um, on something. Uh, for example, I had a sergeant. Uh, I've, we did a lot for correctional officers while I was there to continue to get raises, and now they're in a, in a career ladder. The officer said to me one day, that raise that you got me allowed me to take my son who has autism uh, and pay for his, it worked out exactly to a year's worth of help for his son. So when you have those kind of things that play on them, uh, that they have to deal with every single day, it's going to happen. But I would tell you that's like one to two percent. The rest are, are great, great people that work hard every single day. And most of them are really trying to change themselves. We've talked about where corrections is going, where it's come from. That's not easy. It's not easy to make those changes, but most of them are really good people. But it does happen. That's where it comes from. Thank you so much for well, seeing me. You betcha. Uh, and thank you for being here this morning. Do you know if the ACEs test has ever been administered in any of the jails or prisons in Utah? No. And why not? Um, because what we do is we treat... So the ACEs test was created by medical professionals and it's 10 questions and they're questions such as, have you ever watched one of your parents be beaten? Are any of your parents in prison and or jail? Does anyone in your family have a uh, drug problem or an alcohol pro problem? And it's 10 questions. And what they found is that if a child scores five or more on the ACEs test, oh, ACEs. it's a guarantee that they will end up in jail and or prison at some point in their life. And so now what we're starting to see in other places throughout the country is they're administering the ACEs test in prisons and jails. And what they're finding is that 95% of those that are in jail and or prison have a score of five or more on the ACEs test. I'm sorry, I misheard what you said. I thought you were asked, I honestly thought you said AIDS test. Um, I don't know that we are asking those exact questions, but it is part of the screening process. One of the things that we have identified, a couple of different things. Many of the, the, uh, the people that we're seeing that are incarcerated have some, for, some form of trauma in their life, something that has happened that's led them down that road. Many of the tests and different um, screenings that we put uh, the, the inmates through when they come in through the facility identify those types of things. Um, and then the key thing, though, is the treatment. What, what, and it goes back to what sort of thing are you providing that's actually showing is making a positive outcome in their life. Some of the things that have come out of that type of testing are things where we now um, are managing and providing programming and rehabilitation that's specifically for women. Um, and a lot of it comes from that type of screening that goes on inside of our facility. So I don't know if we're doing that exact test, but much of the testing and screening that we do, it has those same types of parameters around them. Yeah. I just wondered if you could address a little bit about the um, correlation between immigrant populations and the prison population. Increasing immigration. We are heard, we're hearing nationally that um, increasing immigration brings higher crime rates. Are you seeing any of that here? 
All I can tell you is I don't have, um, I don't have any statistics that I can show you. Um, so no, I, you know, I don't feel real comfortable answering that question, mostly because I don't have any statistics that would show it one way or the other. Do you want me to tell you what I know? Okay, because sometimes that's not good. Cause people say, oh, well, that's just... Okay, I, I can tell you what I see. Um, I don't see um, uh, immigrants committing any more crimes than anyone else in this country. In fact, um, what the, the area we deal with, for example, in regards to drugs and those types of things, um, it would be unfair, in my opinion, to be able to say all the drugs are coming from those who are immigrants, for example, from Mexico, or we're having su suddenly a, a problem with um, the Costa Rican gangs or anything like that. The reality is when we're dealing with it, we don't see any increase in crime from any of those folks. Um, so that's my gut. I've never seen it. I've never seen that they're a problem. Hi. Uh, Hi. Have you heard of the Other Side Academy? Yes. Uh, I've worked with them. Okay. I think they've done a fabulous job. Okay. <laughs> you can give us... <laughs> um, they take in people because if you've been in jail, you can't get a job. And um, so this started from a group in San Francisco. They came to Salt Lake and started the Other Side Academy. What they do is people... Young men, they even have a women's section um, that have been in jail, cannot get a job. So they, uh, they take these people after they've been paroled and they're out of jail and they, ha they work for them and they have a moving company. They have three big moving bands now. I've used them. I support them so much. They have <clears throat> the ladies live in another house and they've just bought another house on First South. They get these young people that aren't murderers and rapists. They've done drugs and dumb things, bad choices, I call it, and been in jail. And I think they're doing a fabulous job. And they, uh, if you ever have to move, the other side of Cabney for movers, they have a thrift store now. I've donated a house full of stuff <laughs> to them to help these young people, men and women, in the community. No, I just wanted to tell you about the Other Side Academy. Okay, great. I'll just make one statement, if I could, to that. Um, they, are, they are a tremendous resource. They are not the only resource. You said it almost yourself. The problem with the Other Side Academy is that they don't help all. They are able to pick and choose who they can bring into that particular program, which is awesome, but we don't have that choice. With the Department of Corrections, um, you can say, well, they don't take anyone that's committed a violent crime. Hmm. How many do you think that is? Because when they're on drugs, um, oftentimes they're hitting their parents, or they're uh, stealing something from somebody, or they're committing something that involved violence. The other thing is, is that they're not allowed to associate with some of the people that are in their lives. And that can be good, because we know that people, um, for example, uh, gosh, my mind's going blank so much today, but when they're around certain people, they have a tendency to help them get the things that they want, so they have to keep them away. The other thing the Other Side Academy does not provide is any programming or rehabilitation when they have problems like addictions and so on. They have to get that from the outside. So they're a great resource. That's the thing I want you to hear. They're doing great things, they're helping them find jobs, but it's not for all. They can't solve all the problems, so. I have a question. Kathy. I remember back to, I think it was 2014 or 2015 when the legislature passed the, a huge, uh, prison refer, um, criminal justice reform package that was um, supposed to be um, really setting the direction for these some of these changes you've been describing. And at that time, a lot of the, the funding for these reforms were supposed to come from uh, Medicaid expansion. At least that was my memory, and that did not happen. That's right. So you were in the department at that time. So what? Um, what was done to basically keep this momentum going without the Medicaid expansion? That that's, goes back to what I talked about, how there's nothing in the community. The Medicaid expansion would allow more programming and rehabilitation programs to be able to expand out into the community. That didn't happen. So that obviously affected our criminal justice reform. Criminal justice reform did make a difference and will continue. 
But again, it's something that has to be addressed. When I left, the governor said, can you, you know, I met with him for about an hour, and then he said, can you give me your recommendations in writing, for example, about what things need to occur? What things need to occur is we all need to get back to the table. Those of us that are sitting around the table, we need to bring Sim back to the table. Sim gets frustrated, and I don't blame him one bit. Sim Gill's got to come back to the table. The chiefs of police got to come back to the table, the service providers and so on, so that we can begin that process so that when Medicaid expansion does occur, that we have the people back in place that can help figure out, okay, what's going to work best in the community. So there was progress that was made. Uh, there was reduction in incarceration and so on. And it goes back to that recidivism. But then you soon heard the police officers going, well, just because the recidivism is reduced doesn't mean the public's more safe. Well, that's their quick answer because they don't want to have to deal with the amount of people that are dealing drugs and so on. There's nothing in the community to help them. So, yes, we do need Medicaid expansion if that's what you want me to say. Thank you. Um, oh. Um, how do you view the state legislature um, in terms of their understanding the issues and secondly, funding the needs in the community? Hmm. It's a pretty broad question. I would tell you that I, I learned a lot um, over the five years that I got to work with the legislators and I would tell you that many of them were very much engaged in the process. One of the things that I wanted to do when we, when, and I can just relate what from correction standpoint. We wanted to bring legislatures in and have, have, help them have a better understanding of corrections because it was being ignored. We talked about how things have gone, how bad the, the, the facilities are, how poor the pay is and all that kind of stuff. We brought the legislators in, both sides of, of the aisle, and put them through tours and put them on ride-alongs and got them involved in the process, made them spend time with our correctional officers, make them spend time. I shouldn't say make them, they chose to. They could have told us no with the inmates. For example, uh, you didn't ask about Governor Herbert, but a year ago he came in and spent, and this is a lot of time, about five hours walking around talking with inmates, asking them questions even about medical marijuana and different things like that. So I would tell you from my experience, I had to kick them in the butt, but we got them in there and they are engaged in the process. The other thing I would tell you, the criminal justice reform, this was the first time in my 30 year career that I saw both sides of the aisle starting to come together. They're still kind of there, but someone's got to bring them. Got to bring them back and say, hey, we got to continue to address these issues, not just what we had in corrections, but now what can we do in the community? What can we do in regards to Medicaid expansion? We got to get these things. So my view is, is that the majority of them, at least from correction standpoint, were very much engaged, wanted the information and helped us get the different things that we needed to provide more resources. They were supportive of me in our department. Uh, yes, can, you've said numerous times um, you guys need to fight for these changes. Can you tell us um, exactly what are the ways that we can be involved? I think sometimes it's, you know, I see, I, I, again, I remember I was a chief deputy, which means that I work for an elected official. And the impact I don't think is understood um, by many by being at the, the uh, meet the candidates, by um, holding people accountable, by making sure that you ask the tough questions and say, what are you going to do, sheriff? There's two sheriffs right now. I know them both. It's really hard for me. And they're both awesome people. Um, and then when they do, when they say, hey, here's the things we're going to do. Here's our plan for corrections. Here's our plans for what we're going to do in regards to criminal justice, then hold them accountable. There was plenty of times, for example, when I met with legislators, they would say their constituents want to know this. Roland, I need an answer for that. And we'd go try to get an answer for it. You have to be the voice by just having, I mean, I, I was really surprised. I mean, I've, I've spoke for about an hour now or maybe longer. I'm here at church on Sunday speaking. This is how you do it. This is how you gain it. You bring someone in, and I'm, I think I'm, as long as you guys don't kick me out, I'm going to come in here and have some coffee with you and talk. Um, that's how you do it. You, you become involved. You, you get involved in wanting to be elected and say, hey, oh, I want to be part of the difference. And even if you don't win, you get your voice heard because other people are listening to it. Um, and I know it feels like, if you're anything like me, I always feel like I've heard that before. 
Um, I listened, and I'm telling you, many of them are. And in this world uh, of social media and stuff, there's no place for them to hide. Yes, ma'am. So with the conversation around um, legalizing marijuana on various levels comes the conversation of whether people who are currently incarcerated for minor drug crimes should be released or if people who have already been released should have their records expunged. Um, and obviously that's, that would be a complicated process if it were to become legal here. Uh, what are your thoughts on that and what problems and implications do you see? Yeah, the, <clears throat> the big challenge, you, you jumped ahead a little bit there as if it was implemented. That's the key. Then we'd have to make decisions about, and we already did, we, we'd have to make decisions about who needs to stay incarcerated and who doesn't. Those would be things that we would have to address. Um, the problem with that is, to be honest, we're not incarcerating those that are just smoking marijuana or using marijuana. That's, um, sure, it's like everything else or it's like those drugs that um, people become addicted to. The ones that we have our biggest challenges with are not the marijuana users. They're not in prison. So it's not going to save us a lot. Right off the bat, when I hear people say that, it's going to get everyone out. It's not. If you want to talk about we got to solve problems such as meth, such as heroin, and even cocaine, those types of things, that's where those challenges need to be uh, addressed. The marijuana piece is not going to make a huge difference. I can tell you though, so my friends, my colleagues, and coworkers in Colorado are pulling their hair out, folks. So I'm not gonna give you any, I, I don't have a statistic for you, I'm sorry. But what I can tell you is that our police officers and our corrections officers are going, it's not working. Uh, they're seeing a higher use in their teenagers. They're seeing, uh, uh, more challenges in crimes. They're seeing more challenges when they arrive on scenes of crimes. Um, it's not working like they thought it was going to. I don't know if you've been to Colorado. I mean, it's just like on the, you can go just to the store on the corner. Um, so you didn't ask me about medical marijuana, um, but I can kind of throw this piece in. Again, I'm just telling you what I know, not necessarily there's a statistic to it. Um, those have this led to other challenges as well, people abusing them. But here's the thing, we can adjust. You think that's the, you know, if, if, we, if we're able to legalize marijuana, we're gonna be able to adjust in law enforcement and corrections. When I say legalize marijuana, I mean the medical piece. I'm not gonna go into the whole, I wouldn't tell you. If you're asking me, do I support the legalization of marijuana? I take, I'm just gonna say, I'm not speaking to that. The medical side, we will adjust, but understand there's gonna be people that abuse it and we'll have to adjust accordingly. I love, your, I love your comment about natural light in prison. Uh, I refuse to work on one of, several of these uh, private ho um, prisons that within, were happening in my office, but I did get a chance to work on the Forensic Mental Health Unit. And working with the people there, they were focused on don't do anything that's gonna give them a weapon or, so, or they can pl pl uh, plug up the toilet, that kind of stuff, but I, I thought, well, to me, what would make a difference was natural light in, in, in their rooms. And we, we had very limited light, but we always put it right next to a wall so when the light would wash, come in, it would wash the wall. And then we'd use the transom in the door to pick up light from clear stories in the hallway. So every, every space had, at various times of day, light, natural light from two different sources, but I never know what kind of impact that has on people who are mentally ill. I don't know. Uh, the evidence shows it's awful on them. It, not only is it awful on them, it's awful, awful on the people that are working in there. You remember, you got officers that are working 10, 12 hour days in there. So again, I, I get a little excited about that because the, the units have this huge open area that allows that site in. We also will have rooms, many of you guys have probably seen them, uh, where you can actually, an inmate says, I need a timeout can I just get away for a minute? And they can go to a room that has a mural on the wall where music is playing. Did you enjoy the music? I know I did. Bring some peace of mind. Instead of us having to go in and lay hands on somebody, wouldn't it be better for them to go, I need a break before I break something and go into a room, be able to listen to music. All those things are coming together now in corrections. I talked about getting rid of isolation cells, but again, 
we have to continue to move down that path, and it's slow. It's too slow for some. I, I know that, but it makes a difference. It really does. I'm going to pose the last question to you. Okay. Gary Deland. Nope. Utah policies and procedures standards uh, for uh, total institutions where people eat, sleep, and live in correspondence to, say, Utah jails, where statistically we've been seeing a significant rise in suicides, uh, deaths, uh, in our uh, 29 jails. Uh, he has a, a unique system which is very controversial, and we don't know exactly what it is, the specifics. I'm wondering if you could comment to that. I can. So I guess the thing, I, first thing I would do is, is uh, Gary and I... Um, disagreed. I want you all to know that uh, I think the thing that's not ever said, it's interesting to me, that, um, that Gary had a, a huge positive impact on jails in Utah. Utah really is actually considered to have some of the best run jails in the country operationally. Is it perfect? No. Um, this was the first place to have inspections, to have standards. And he played that role. The challenge that I had, um, and Gary and I uh, split on this, um, was the transparency piece. Just being able to see the standards. Um, he has his reasons for protecting those things, um, and I didn't agree. And so that's where we began the process of basically building our own. The thing I can tell you is those standards, they're um, the thing that always gets put in the newspaper and stuff that I don't understand, I, I do because that's, that's all they're able to see, but just the negative side of that. The jail standards help every single one of those jails solve problems. It helps us, for example, from the state's point of view, be able to manage those different jails. The key is, though, you guys should be able to see those things. When you say, I need you to fight for it, how can you fight for something if you don't know what's going on? When they said, for example, I, and I just know the media did it, horrible things are going on in Davis County Jail. We want to know what that, what that thing was that was going on. I, I really, I don't feel comfortable completely telling you what that was, where they failed, but it wasn't something horrible. It had something to do with paperwork. But when you don't have transparency, if people can't come and say, what are those jail standards? What are you holding them to? What are they messing up on? Are they feeding correctly? Are they providing medical care? Are they doing those things? You should be able to see it. So the answer to that is, uh, when it comes to the jail standards, we, that's when I went to the governor and said, we need to go a different direction. So we had a lot of different meetings. Um, one involved Gary DeLand basically saying we're going a different direction, and then now the process of building the transparent standards that you're gonna see in the future. And the one thing I would say is we're, we're including the ACLU, we're including the Disability Law Center, um, again, this is my first time to speak after that, but they will be involved in the process and should be allowed as part of the inspection process. That's the direction we were headed when I left. So, that let's, e let's express appreciation to our speaker, Roland Cook.